Ready. Open up the waiting room and uh, start the live stream uh, when you're ready there, Max. I'm ready. Awesome. Now, this is a new mic. Is it this volume good? Low, low high? This is the first time I'm using this thing. I can hear you perfectly. Great. All right. It's got a few settings on it. And I was playing with them. So. <laughs> no, you're good. <clears throat> Okay, so we got about 13 minutes. All right, folks, we've opened up the waiting room here, started the live stream. So I'll just say welcome everyone uh, in person or via Zoom to Soil in the City, how cultivating living soil can improve our relationship with urban ecosystems. This event is part of the MDES 2020 Research Creation Residency here at Forest Space from May 2nd to the 12th. 2022. That's a lot of twos. We are coming to you live from Concordia University's Force Space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands in Jojage, Montreal. At Force Space, we work to connect people to the initiatives, research projects, and dialogues that are happening across the university. So we're very pleased to have the opportunity to collaborate with Lindsay Weller, who organized this event, to welcome Marco Thomas in, and perhaps other folks want to jump into the conversation uh, for this presentation and kind of roundtable conversation. So welcome all, and I'll pass it over to Lindsay to say hello and introduce Marco. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming this afternoon. I know uh, it's been hard to uh, get people to um, have time to spend on a workshop on a Monday afternoon. So if you are here, I appreciate you making the time. Um, so I've been a fan of Marco Thomas's work for quite a long time and have been trying to my best to follow his practices uh, via social media and a little bit of um, experimentation um, on my own. But uh, it's not as easy as Marco makes it look. Um, Marco's a natural farmer. He's uh, working out of Richmond, Virginia, and he specializes in uh, microbial inputs and, and has um, at least engaged with. I'm not sure how much of his systems he developed on his own. He can talk more about that, but he's creating incredible um, soil microbial inputs and building beautiful relationships with these microbes on his farm. And he's going to tell us a lot more about that right away. So I'll pass it over to you, Marco. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you for having me here. And yeah, like you said, I am a natural farmer. Um, by trade, I build uh, high rise buildings, but for the purpose of this, I'm a natural farmer. And, uh, you know, what, what is natural farming? You know, a lot of people hear that term and I want to give a little bit, um, you know, kind of a description of, of what it is. And really what natural farming is, is it's a way of growing your plants or cultivating crops. And it takes you to a time uh, before there were stores that you can go to buy fertilizer. You know how now if, a, if people want to start a garden, the first thing they do, they might run to their big box store, um, buy a few bags of things and bring those home. And then now you're gardening or farming. Um, and what natural farming does is um, what we what we do is we want to focus on, like I said, taking it back to the time before um, you had that luxury um, and actually probably a detriment to being able to go to the store and buy these chemical fertilizers. Um, you had to make these things on your own if you wanted to grow your crops. And a lot of the um, <clears throat> A lot of those practices has, have been kind of forgotten, you know, and and a lot of that purposefully um, by, you know, big agriculture practices. Um, a lot of those would prefer that you make or I'm sorry, would prefer that you buy things um, that they make instead of making them yourself. And um, so just as a natural farmer, um, think mindset of um, using what's available to you, um, looking around your property and gathering things and plants that can you can use to grow you know grow your garden and plants and um and the major part of natural farming is the collection of imo or indigenous microorganisms um so what what that is is uh if you look guys look at a forest you know and you see it you see all these trees growing you see all these plants you see birds you see just so much health and, and diversity in a forest 
And, the, you know, you got to think to yourself, no one ever had to go out there and fertilize this forest. You know, you have these huge trees, um, abundant uh, plants, so much diversity. And, you know, think, how, how is all that growing, you know? And the way it's growing is it's growing because of the relationship between the plants and the soil food web. And part of that soil food web is the microbiology. Um, if you think about, you know, one of our prep principles in natural farming is do as nature does. And that can mean many things, you know, but in this particular example, I'm going to give do as nature does. So when you look at a forest, you see in the fall, you know, leaves drop, you know, those leaves drop, they lay there all winter. Well, what's happening is when those leaves drop, now the microbes, the microbes in the soil are taking those leaves and breaking them down. You know, you got different things like centipedes from the larger level, uh, so soil millipedes, excuse me, isopods, earthworms, the larger kind of shredders that I call them. Um, those are kind of breaking those leaves down into the first stage of decomposition. And then now the soil microbiology is actually going to be taking that um, the material and frass and, and, and what was left over from the shredders and now break that down even further and then make relationships with the plant roots. Um, and, and then now that's, that's, that's the part of nutrient cycling you have in the forest. So do as nature does, how does that help me in my garden? So one example would be now as the farmer, we're growing crops all season. And then at the end of the year, when uh, when, we're, when the crops are done, you guys know if you ever grow tomatoes, you kind of go and you end up with more tomatoes than you could ever eat. And at the end of the season, then, you know, you kind of have a, an excess. Well, if you if we if you go back to the example we just talked about, you know, end of the season, nature drops its leaves, creates food for itself through decomposition. So us as the farmer, we can do that same practice at the end of the season when I grow tomatoes or whatever I grow instead of pulling those plants up by the root, I chop them at the soil level. And now I also chop up the plants themselves and lay them right down on the same bed that they came out of. You know, that's a form of nut nutrient cycling. That's letting nature work for me. That's me as a farmer doing a practice that nature's already doing and proven it works. And then now I'm doing that in my garden. So that's just one example, you know, do as nature does. Um, and, you know, microbiology, you know, IMO, that's a, that's a big word you hear a lot of times. Um, that is a, um, th this whole process, natural farming, or some even know it as KNF. I'm going to back up a little bit and give a little bit to the kind of the, the beginnings of the, of the practice. So KNF, Korean natural farming, as we know it today, was developed by a, a, a man named um, Young Sang Cho. Um, he is... Uh, of Korean descent. I mean, uh, he is, is, is of Asian descent and, I'm, and they live in Korea. And what he did was develop this um, system of using uh, ferments and different um, uh, plants to make inputs. And so part of the, you know, the Korean natural farming is the collection of IMO, which we were kind of just already talking about. And not only that, I mentioned earlier, uh, using plants that are available to you to make different fertilizers. One example of a KNF or Korean natural farming input um, that Master Cho, that's, that's what he goes by, Master Cho um, invented is a FPJ, fermented plant juice. And what that is, is a simply taking plant material. You want to take plants and harvest them at, the, at daybreak, at sunrise. You know, you want to catch the plants when they are when they are still coated with dew when the microbiology is the highest so now just say for instance stinging nettle i go out i harvest some stinging nettle and now what an easy input fpj weigh that plant material combine it with equal weight sugar um, a good unrefined sugar works best like jaggery or demerara um, or raw sugar um, and now what you do is combine that equal weight with the sugar. And what happens is via osmosis, the sugar takes the moisture that's in that plant, moisture, enzymes, all the um, 
you know, beneficial parts of that plant and I pulls them out into the sugar. And then over a period of five days after that ferments, that's a mild alcohol fermentation, at five days, you can strain that liquid off. And now that's a liquid that you can store. And that's a natural farming input that can be used to feed your garden. Um, there are many different inputs. That's one example. Um, and so the same family also said, okay, a lot of people, you know, don't have the access to sugar around the uh, world. You know, a lot of times sugar is a very valuable um, asset to people and commodity. You know, it's not something that people will be looking highly upon, you know, using in their garden. So what, the, what Master Cho did was he said, I want to have been a, a, a process for even lower cost. So now what he did was instead of making an FPJ with that stinging nettle, I can take that stinging nettle, combine that in a container, half container full of plant, such as stinging nettle, which is a dynamic accumulator plant, or comfrey, same kind of plant. I can combine that half a container, fill the rest with water, and now toss in some soil biology like leaf mold or good forest soil, just a handful, throw that in there. And then now that is what he titled Jadam, J-A-D-A-M. That would be a Jadam liquid fertilizer. Think about it. That's even lower cost than you know before because we didn't even now we don't need the sugar. And what that JLF is doing is really kind of hyper or, 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 or speeding up that chop and drop process that we talked about, where the plants drop leaves, decompose. Well, we're doing all that in a barrel now. So what we end up with is a liquid, which is readily available plant nutrients that we could just scoop out of our barrel and now feed into our garden. So with that said, th those are two kind of um, you know inputs. Um, and that kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about for microbiology. So what, what, what the way to collect IMO, you know, we talked about that IMO, the indigenous microorganisms. So I'm just going to take you through a quick um, collection process, Lindsay, and then we can kind of regroup and we can go from there. As I know I'm hitting everybody with a lot of, a lot of info. So, um, and I'd like to share my screen. Uh, let's do that. Okay, and um, can you guys see that uh, on the side there? All right, so if you look over here on this slide, you know, the picture, you see all this white, um, and you see this white mycelium growing on this log? That is, that is fungi, that is decomposition, that is part of what we we're talking about, the nutrient cycling. So when I look for, when I go to the forest and, and I want to collect this indigenous microorganisms, I want to look for areas like this under the leaves. You know, I want to pull those leaves back and see where that decomposition is going on. Now that I've found it, you can do one of two things. I could easily take some of these pieces with me. Um, and I don't know if I'm still sharing, but um, yes, it looks like I am. I can take some of these pieces with me when I'm walking in the forest and bring them home to my garden. And you can do something as simple as either just put these into your garden soil, or we just talked about the JLF. You can use these kinds of things to be your inoculant as your leaf mold for your to start your JLF, your liquid fertilizer. Um, but a, a natural farming method, which I can, so now I want to be able to take this home and keep it in this exact state. So what I would do is I would take a box, a wicker box or wicker basket or a cedar um, box, and I want to get rice, rice, which is somewhat cooked, partially cooked, a little bit al dente. You know, you wouldn't really eat rice in a kind of a hard uh, state like this where the middle's a little bit hard. But for the collection of IMO, it's perfect. So I'll take partially cooked rice. And now I want to put it either in a wicker basket or a wooden box. Go out to the forest again, like we said. Um, look for a big oak trees, big hardwood trees scrape down near their base and then you'll start seeing this white material and that's that's the mycelium we're looking for scrape that away set your box on this spot now 
a good thing to have is like a Rubbermaid or a plastic bin or a tote that you can cover over your box because what you don't want is you don't want rain getting into it and you don't want uh, like critters getting into it like mice and squirrels or birds and things like that. So you want to place your box on the ground, on the soil in a good spot and then cover it with if you have wire mesh, that's fine. And then a, a plastic tote over that. And what happens is now the rice that's in that box becomes a food source for the microbiology that's in the forest floor that's feeding all these trees and all these plants. And what, that what happens is over the course of anywhere from three to 10 days, depending on the temperature, rice will colonize, I mean, I'm sorry, microbes will colonize um, your box of rice. And then when you come out and collect it, you'll see, if it's a good collection, you'll see a lot of white fuzz. You wanna see white fuzzy my ceiling because that's that fungal decomposition that we want into our gardens so now we go we, we we go back and check on our rice and our rice is nice and fuzzy and if you can see this picture this is not of the rice collection but this is very similar to that white we're looking for on <clears throat> on the rice um, so now picture you have this box now you have this fuzzy rice in it so now what I want to do is I want to capture that fuzzy rice, which is the soil microbiology, and I want to capture that in time. I want to um, make it dormant. And the way I make that dormant is I do it the same way as I talked about that FPJ earlier with sugar. So I want to take equal weight. I'm going to weigh that fuzzy rice, and I want to, and I want to take equal weight that rice, uh, which is IMO1, indigenous microorganisms one, Combine it with sugar, mix it up, knead it together really good. And then now that paste can go into a jar. And now that is a shelf stable form of indigenous microorganisms that you can keep in your, in your house, on your shelf, in your shop. Um, and that is now called IMO2. It's stable because the microbes were rendered, um, the sugar pulled the, all the moisture out of the microbe bodies just like we were pulling it out of the plant earlier um, via osmosis. And even though this thing looks wet, the microbial bodies are now dry and, and into a dormant state. So now when I have this jar of uh, sugary rice, that's my IMO2. That's one collection. What, we, what, what is recommended with natural farming is take many of those collections. So you want several of those jars of IMO2 on your shelf because then you're building that diversity. You want to collect them in the summer. You want to collect them in the spring and the winter and the fall. And you want to collect them in different regions. And what that does is that just gives you a snapshot of the strongest microbiology that came from that soil from that region at that time. And then what happens is once you get more into this, you have, you know, I have over a dozen different collections of these IMOs. And now that's what gives you your strength when you want to start inoculating different things. Like we talked before, Lindsay, just kind of inoculating the grains and things. I think when you start collecting these IMOs, it'll kind of be a jump start in that direction. Yeah, I think uh, just from watching you online that I, I hadn't quite understood the IMO2 step and how important that was. So um, I definitely appreciate the, the step by step. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, that's kind of um, in a nutshell, that takes us to the collection of IMO. And the reason why, um, you know, IMOs are so important, you know, that's the foundation of the soil health, you know? Um, and I'll just read this that I got up here, you know, IMO are the reason a forest never needs fertilizer or any outside inputs to grow strong and healthy. IMO are at work nonstop breaking down organic materials such as leaves and fruit into readily available plant nutrients. IMO form symbiotic relationships with plant roots. Think mycorrhizal fungi and nitrogen fixing bacteria and legumes. The plants produce exudates that are preferred by certain microbes and those microbes in turn reward the plant with nutrients or the ability to absorb more nutrients. Natural farmers should look for strong growing deciduous forests and collect IMO at the base of big trees. IMO is collected with par cooked rice placed in a cedar box or wicker basket and left on the forest floor for a period of approximately three days to a week, depending on how warm the temperatures are. If it's really hot out, 
90 degrees, 80, 90, three days is going to be really the key, sometimes two. Um, when it's cooler out, it'll go a little bit longer. You'd be up to a week or 10 days. Um, uh, once the rice has been inoculated, and that's that fuzz we talked about, that's our IMO1. Combine equal weight IMO1, unrefined sugar. This is called IMO2, which was made shelf stable as the sugar pulled the moisture out of the micro bodies, rendering them dormant until they are rehydrated. Uh, the farmer is encouraged to take many IMO collections around the region in different seasons, use them to maximize the microbial diversity in their gardens and fields. The simplest way to use IMO2, take that jar, roughly a teaspoon per gallon, and, and, that's a, and mix that into a gallon of water without chlorine, and just pour that into your beds. Um, if you want, really want to maximize your IMO, that's when we got to take it farther. We got to take it up to IMO three and on into IMO four. Um, that's where we, IMO three is where now we're taking um, these microbes and we're starting to inoculate grains and different substrates. And now we're taking those microbes and we're multiplying them. If, if the rice, the initial fuzzy rice collection was one X, then if you look on this slide, this is a piece of IMO4. If that fuzzy rice was 1x, this is probably 10,000x. That's how many times we've multiplied that biology, the strength of it, you know, and what that does is that, that that's going to give us our nutrient cycling in our soil. That's what's going to make our plants healthy. You know, it's not all about, you know, buying a fertilizer and pouring it in. The reason you buy that for fertilizer and pour it in is because you're not nutrient cycling. You're not focused on the IMO. See that IMO when it's in your soil, that's going to give my plants way more nutrients and much better, cleaner nutrients than you could ever get out of, you know, a bottle of a synthetic fertilizer. Um, so that's why it's important to make these things because another part of it is, you know, everyone talks about, you know, regenerative and those things are wonderful. And, you know, everyone talks about organic. Well, you know, just because something has an organic label, uh, they're still allowed to use many different chemicals. Um, and, and also not only that, you still don't quite know what all was going on with that food um, that they grew in that organic way. So I look at natural farming as an ultra way, ultra organic, you know, it's beyond organic. It's, it's so clean because I'm literally growing plants that I'm using to make fertilizer. So I'm, so I'm closing my loops, you know what I mean? And, and closing loops is a big thing. Um, another thing with natural farming, um, food waste, you know, we don't want to waste our food scraps. We want to reuse those, you know, um, there's some uh, composting methods called Bokashi out there, which I like to do Bokashi. Um, you guys can read up on that, but, but what Bokashi is, is, is an inoculated grain um, it's been inoculated with mainly lactobacillus or bacillus bacteria, which are kind of your fermentation bacteria. And what happens is, is you can put food waste into a bucket and then you can sprinkle on these grains, which have been inoculated with uh, Bokashi. And then you can seal that bucket. And what happens is in a period of two weeks, the uh, microbiology inoculates all the food in that bucket breaks down those tough fibers. For instance, if you were to put an apple in there, you know how guys an apple is, it's kind of firm. Um, once you come out of there in two weeks, that apple's very mushy, very soft. All of the, all of the um, tough fibrous components of that are pre-composted if you want to look at it like that. And what happens is now, say if I bit an apple and then I said, I don't want it anymore and I just buried it in my garden. It will take time for those nutrients to become plant available. Let's say if I take an apple, put that in the Bokashi bucket and then two weeks, pull it out. Now put it directly in the soil. Now the soil biology and the plants immediately jump on that. <clears throat> they immediately can get in there and start feeding off that. So what Bokashi is a good way to, you know, speed up processes as well, you know, and, and, now, and fer fermentation is kind of part of decomposition. Um, you know, when things break down with water, you, you kind of, that's kind of part of the process. Um, so I just kind of wanted to briefly mention Bokashi and uh, food scraps so people can at least look it up and kind of dig into that a little more. Um, but yeah, so for most part, um, that's kind of, we can stop there at microbiology, Lindsay, if you want to go into some Q&A or, or, or whatever you want to do. Well, can you um, 
Uh, thank you so much for such a, a detailed description. And I, I definitely, like I said, hearing it this way, I'm already grasping the process a lot, a lot more. Mm -hmm. So it's really exciting for me to hear you go into detail about your work. Um, when we spoke the other day, we touched on a little bit, um, just because I'm really interested overall in in sort of supporting and fostering um, and and increasing the use of and presence of indigenous indigenous plants in cities, and. Um, I know I'm not alone in, in, in having difficulties sometimes in dealing with especially wild collected indigenous seeds um, and getting them to start. And I think that that aspect of some of these plants is why people tend to avoid them. Um, so you mentioned a, a technique that you, that you use a little bit um, for, where you soak seeds ahead of time in, in one of your uh, microbial mixes. So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that aspect of your practice. Yes, um, yes, seeds, uh, seed soak solution. Uh, for some reason, the initial is SES in natural farming. <laughs> so, uh, but we call it seed soak solution. And what that is, is it takes three parts of natural farming. Um, our OHN, and I didn't talk about that, but OHN stands for, um, it's an herbal nutrient. It stands for oriental herbal nutrient. I uh, get that oriental is, is not really a thing, but the person who invented it is from Asia and he calls it oriental herbal nutrient. So that's what, that's what I call it. Um, so OHN um, combined, and, that, and what OHN is, it's five root herbs. I'll just give you a quick, I gotta kind of give you a little bit on each thing because else you don't get it. So OHN, five root herbs, angelica, cinnamon, licorice, um, ginger, garlic. And I know cinnamon is not necessarily a root. Um, so those five, are tinctured in a process that takes 21 days of stirring. So each day they're stirred once. Um, so those, those roots and, and cinnamon are tinctured with alcohol, light vodka, stirred for 21 days. And then now that liquid is extracted. And now those are mixed at a ratio of two times of two times Angelica and then one of the others all go together. So if you're doing a gallon, it'd be two gallons of Angelica, a gallon of ginger, gallon of you know, on down the line like that. Now, when those are combined, that is now called OHN. That's an invigorating um, herbal nutrient. I take that for my body and that's also good for your plants. If you think about it, just in short, when you take a sip of alcohol, right? And you feel that warm feeling, it comes off of your body, right? It doesn't take long, right? Think about that. So we tinctured those um, those beneficial root and, and, and cinnamon um, into alcohol. So now those five together, they're very invigorating. So when I sip that, that goes straight into my body. It takes all five of those straight out all the way into my body, just like the alcohol does, because they're riding on that molecular level. Now it's the same for my plant. So I use OHN as one of the things in the seed soak, so, um, and FPJ, which we mentioned earlier, you know, the, the plant and the sugar extracted after five days, and then a raw vinegar. In, in natural farming, they use a lot of brown rice vinegar. I make my own vinegars. So those three components are the light dilution, um, uh, roughly a thousand, one to 1,000. So one teaspoon per gallon dilution. Um, and now soak your seeds in that if you've got a tiny seed, you know, you got to go by the size of the seed. So if you think of a tobacco seed, just a little speck, you know, you, that would be like a soak for like 15 seconds and plant, you know, so, so quick. Um, a bean, you know, you soak a bean for several hours, you know what I mean? So kind of give you a range and in, 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 um, in, in difference there. But what happens is we do that because what we want is when that seed ruptures, we want that first tap root immediately to have a relationship of microbiology. Because what happens is, if you look, you know, the soils we build are so diverse and so tough and so you know, strong and robust, you know, we need those seeds to be able to come on out and get on in there and, and be able to hold up. And, and, and what that does, that seed soak solution um, to me and, and to what natural farmers, um, our mindset is that we're coated immediately as soon as that seed erupts. Um, and not only that, it, it also is because, you know, when a seed, um, when a seed um, sprouts, 
water has entered that seed, right? So liquid had to enter that seed to get the process started. So we also want that first liquid into it to be kind of that invigorating with the OHN, the FPJs, and a little bit of that microbiology. Um, and that just gets the seed started off really quick. Now, the same thing goes for trees. If you wanted to transplant a bunch of your reeds or trees or whatever it may be, when I get trees, I'll knock the root, the dirt, dirt off the roots. I'll make a SES the same way, seed soak in a wheelbarrow now. Boom, set them in there overnight. And then that just gets your trees jump started the same way. So I think that'd be a really um, good way for you to kind of get into, you know, kind of get those indigenous uh, plants going. And also, since we collect indigenous microbiology, um, you if you wanted to do seed balls, you could even collect the IMO make your clay seed balls with that IMO in there and now scatter those out with your indigenous, um, you know, plants and get it and really probably get those started off nice. Yeah, because, you know, the whole like concept of gorilla gardening, like people keep sending me this video, it's like viral on TikTok and it's a skateboarder with a shaker of seeds. <laughs> but um, I, I don't have a lot of hope for some of those seeds just because of the conditions in, in the in the city um mm. i guess i was going to ask you so so the fpj you're using like a fresh plant that you're just chopping down and then yes. and so what about like would a seed so because you mentioned you take imo two teaspoon of it into a gallon of water like could could there be a way to also increase some of uh, include some of the collected microbes um, into that soak, you know, or, or am I getting that already from the, say, if I did a stinging nettle FPJ? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think that could, that, that's not a bad idea. I haven't thought to add the IMO2 into my um, seed soak. I have to think about that, but um, I may do that and, uh, and have to shout you out because that's a great way of thinking. That's the mindset we're on right there. And that's yeah. The, the, um, yeah. yeah, it just, it, it makes me really curious about, you know, why not to adding, adding that in and if maybe, because I'm, I'm wondering what it is, you know, about indigenous seeds that make it a lot harder is, is it, I'm curious, is it because of the lack of and sort of absence of that microbial life um, and that possibly these more cultivated and and um, processed, you can say seeds. I, I just I get I get a feeling that they're bred to start better in sort of unnatural environments, and so instead of trying to have um, a seed work better for us, you sort of ontologically ask what the seeds need. Yes. Um, and then I guess I'm just sort of wondering, do you? Have you ever imagined some of your interventions on a more, uh, you know, broad scale? Like, could this, you know, let's say, like, I'm just really interested in like brown sites or the sides of railway tracks, and it just seems like there's such a lost opportunity to create habitat in, in cities. Mm -hmm. And so, what do you think the possibilities would be there for? Uh, uh, you know, broadcast spraying areas that are seeded out indigenously instead of, you know, laid out with sod um, and things like that. And another thing, just a side note before I forget, it's really cool because it sounds like you don't need a lot of land. Like you're, you're, you're creating these sort of concentrated, you know, inputs in jars where if you think of mm -hmm. fertilizer and manure, this, these are huge operations. Um, so it, it sounds like it could be something that could easily be broadcast sprayed and things like that. But do you think it could scale up in that way? Or, or you know, what do you think of my sort of drawing you into my urban conversation? <laughs> it seems like that's the missing link. Like if you look around, right. um, you know, there's meadows that have been recently seeded out here and they're just completely filled with um, uh, invasive species now. And so, in your experience, do you think that working with soil first could help us sort of scale up some of these types of interventions? Yeah, I do. I think that's a that's a great approach. Um, and my farm is actually an urban farm. I'm in Petersburg. Um, I'm in the Old Town Historic District. 
the back of it is, is backed up to a railroad track. And on the, on the other side of the railroad track is the Appomattox River, um, which I wish the track wasn't there, but um, yeah. Yeah, so it's all good. <laughs> yeah. I can still walk back. I can still walk across. But um, yeah, so so one of the things that I wanted to do with this space is because it was just it, it, the property was um, first built in 1890. Um, it's a historic district. And at that time, it was just um, like the craftsmen of our area lived on this Grove Avenue where this property was. And this building that's on our property was a grocery store. So that's kind of cool. Um, so just a little bit of a, the history, but so when I bought it three years ago, you know, this place was built in 1890. Um, it's got a building on it. There was a couple, there was another house which had been um, torn down. So I got in, it was the one building, one house, and then you know, three quarters of an acre, you know, lot kind of. And um, which is good size for the city. But <clears throat> so step one for me was I didn't know what was going on on the land before I got there. Um, so step one for me, I just want to start bringing in organic material, wood chips. I got hundreds and hundreds of yards of wood chips when they, they cut all our city trees down, started piling them up, just spreading them all out everywhere. Um, now that kind of gives me, kind of got me to where I'm starting to build up my soil a little bit, building that carbon. And those kind of, you know, kind of go from there. But so I got a section of it, which I'm keeping all indigenous as well. I want all Virginia local, you know, indigenous plants. And what, the way I've done that was I um, I went through and didn't didn't do anything to it. Just kind of left one area where I wasn't kind of messing with it all and left let it just let it grow. And so now um, year two. I can go in there and now I can see which ones I, I want to keep in this area. So I kind of just walk in here and I hope oh, don't want that. Cut it out. Oh, I like that. Oh, they're too close together. Let me move one over here. And now I'm kind of managing that land. So I think it takes a little bit of just kind of a little bit of management, uh, even if you're gorilla, because you kind of got to let what you're trying to grow get established. Because sometimes, like you said, if, you know, kutsu, if you guys even have that, for some reason, that was never around when I was a kid. Now, kutsu is on every highway, it seems like in the United States. Um, so that's weird. But, you know, if you think about some of the things that are not in, in, indigenous here, um, they could outcompete them. So I want to go in there and kind of go in there and just put as the gardener be the, that kind of helping helping hand to make sure i can get an indigenous area and then once it gets established then it kind of can do its own thing you know but um i forgot kind of how what your question was but i think um no no that, yeah i think we're on the same page. scaling it up and being the city and you just um touched on something that you know it, it is like i want to ultimately maybe build on this knowledge i really like the idea of seed ball or, or some kind of we talked about me being interested in using mycelium as more of a scaffolding, but until today, that process, the, the, the osmosis thing with the sugar, I wasn't um, as aware of. And so, yeah, I, I feel like I'm leaving today with maybe some tools to practice a bit more. Um, yes. But ultimately, you're right. In it, and I think that, you know, as much as we can, because the reeds, the Phragmites reeds that I study, I, I don't want to transplant them. I want to stop them from growing. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> okay. They're really invasive, like maybe the plant that they're on every single highway, railroad, and they're. Um, I'll actually share my screen really quickly and just. So it sounds like the kudzu. I think I've probably seen them. Those tall reeds. They look like bamboo. They're monsters. So here's. Uh, I just took these photos this morning, and I was fascinated. They've really got a strategy um, where. So, to me, um, let me see. Why isn't it? Double. Do I have to also close this? Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. Now I've always thought those were cool looking, so they're very, very invasive, huh? That's yeah, and and, and that's one thing that's really interesting is a lot of people think they're cool looking, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but what what I what I thought was a little bit interesting in this picture that I'm pointing out is they've got they're almost they've got all their bases covered in that the thatch that you see here so they grow straight from the ground up every year um, like bamboo um, so you've got all of this debris as you can see that is i'm really curious about how we can sort of repurpose all of this material possibly into some of the imo processes that you engage in but 
I thought was really interesting here is, is um, this is newly seeded out area and it's, it's got this advantage in the spring. Like I'm not seeing a ton of uh, seasonal advantage from the mm -hmm. existing stands. They're not getting direct sunlight. The thatch is super, super thick and it's, it's slowing them down in the existing stands. Whereas they're, they've compensated by this biologically because they have so many seeds that this is just, the size of this stand is doubled. Um, doubling just this year. So, but I do think that noticing the, um, um, how it slows itself down with the hatch is super valuable information for controlling it. And then sometimes it just cities, like I'm sure you do this too. If you wanted to say you had existing grass and you need to get rid of it or weeds, for example, it's just a really simple solution of Cardboard. covering it. And so, this is these types of things um, is what I'm not seeing city like it just seems like the reason why I wanted to bring you in I, I guess oh you can't see what's going yeah, on yeah let me see that sorry one second here I have to do this voila okay yeah that's covering is key and that's kind of why I brought in all those wood chips because we had a lot of Bermuda, right. gla Bermuda grass which is a pain in the butt yeah and, um yeah and, I, and the chips helped out with that a lot okay so i was wondering was the grass winning or were the reeds winning but you say the reeds are kind of still winning over here huh well these all of this what looks like grass is i'm a, it's i'm positive it's, it's uh, just baby reeds so, oh no. yeah like uh oh gosh here's a close-up of them yeah, you can just oh, tell God. that it's it's not grass. It's Does anything? Wow, I bet not much eats that eats it either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, what I'm, I guess I thought I'd pick your brain a little a bit about quickly is like, if I get wood chips, and then would I ever consider, say, inoculating those wood chips? beforehand if I wanted to. So let's say, for example, I went onto this site. I didn't, I did it wrong again. I keep, my tech skills are lacking here. Okay. So let's say I went to this site, cut the reeds down. And, and my vision is, you know, you learn when the seeds are not ready to let go, cut before then. Mm -hmm. um, and then let's say we covered, or even the existing thatch, maybe we're just laying what's there down. Would I inoculate that ahead of time? Or, or is, like I know, say for example, wood chips, you seem to, I've read some studies, the microbial uh, buildup happens really quickly. But yeah. in my experience, with th these are so waterproof. They have this almost um metallic sort of sheen to the interior of the stem sheets and they're quite resistant to breakdown <clears throat> and um yeah so what do you, what do you think about that? would i cover them shredded. with additional wood chips or you know do, do you have any thoughts and if i were to cover like a really aggressive stand like this would it just be about blocking the light or would i right away could i bring in something else maybe imo2 or three or four and and have more of a sort of systematic um, um, attack on well the thing is if you bring in the imos the imos are just going to probably just hang out and make relationships and build right, and soil them. for them you know mm -hmm. what i mean mm -hmm. um but it looks like if you could get them shredded up or chopped up they could be used to make imo3 you know, as that, um, as that kind of, because usually we'll use like a grain and a wood chip for IMO3. Yeah. Um, possibly this can substitute for, you know, the wood chips, it, just depending on the consistency when you shred it. Mm -hmm. um, man, these things are rough. I'd probably say chop and drop, but then you cover with cardboard, then some wood chips, you know, it, it's yeah. probably going to take a multi blocking light, you know, yeah. weight, and all kinds of things on them, these guys. Yeah. Yeah, um, as uh, you know, uh, that that could be part of the, you know my design process as well. But yeah, I, I just thought I would pick your brain because the, they're, they're almost doing it to themselves already, and so it would just be a matter of you know timing the the seed 
intervention, like getting the seeds out of there before they have time to spread and then coverage. And just sort of the narrative in Canada around these reeds is sort of like, they're here to stay. There's nothing we can do. But then, I'm, then I look at your work and just what I see like backyard gardeners doing with these simple like, you know, they're, they're one thing about them is like again to happen on like, you know, what does the plant want? What does the microbe want? Well, what these plants super don't want is shade. And so, I mean, that right there tells me that covering is probably going to be really effective. Like mm -hmm. they're not shade tolerant at all. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I, I'm just... Had it not been a Monday afternoon, I, I hoped to sort of get um, maybe somebody in the city to sort of open up the idea of maintenance to more of a, an idea of stewardship or care and to step away from, you know, the mechanization of a lot of this quote unquote maintenance that we do. Right. I think it's people like you that are should be leading leading the way, which is which is why I wanted to open up the discussion about that. Um, and I also, um, hi, Natalie and Kate and Carrie, <laughs> thank you for coming. And I don't know if, and hi, Paula, um, do, do any of you have any questions? I know Carrie is uh, my former business partner in Winnipeg and Carrie and I worked a lot on uh, experimentation with different ground covers, um, and she's probably been working more closely with indigenous plants than I have. Uh, let me stop sharing. In that, at least in the past two years. So I just wanted to invite any comments from you guys, if there are any, but it seems like maybe not. Um, yeah, uh, that was a little bit much, but. Hopefully, some of these things kind of spark Hi, a little interest. Hi. <laughs> Hi, hey. sorry to interrupt, Marco. Hey, no problem. Go ahead. Or are you just saying hi, Care? Oh, I'm saying hi, and then I'll, uh, I'll have a little uh, chat after Marco's finished uh, his idea there. Yeah, I just was, um, I, I can't remember what I was going to say now, but um, it's kind of just making the point that, um, you know, I, I, I like to, the fact that like I'm, I'm like you Lindsay like certain things I don't think they're worth fighting you got to kind of try to figure out a way to work with them in a way um that's kind of tough but maybe like you said if you can figure out that way you know if it's a certain crimp that you should that you need to do on them while they're standing at a certain time before yeah. seas and in certain coverage and in certain process maybe that could work um but it looks like I'm sure a lot of people say just burn them <laughs> but you know obviously in the urban environment you can't be using fire i guess to that extent and fire would probably it stimulate them to go yeah. more you know yeah. it's free carbon so one interesting thing is that reed grasses like that uh, you know they're they have water filter um yeah. you know potential and so by understanding when they're seeding out when maybe there's a certain window of time where you can chop them back and they don't reinvigorate so I guess ultimately my point is, is that even at the city level, if we work with plants sort of first, instead of imposing like weed whackers as a, as a solution, we might actually get somewhere with these species. So Carrie, um, I'll leave it to you with your question. Love that. Um, hi, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, I guess I, I was just sort of following along and uh, um, it is quite interesting what to, like to build the soil first and to work with, uh, I liked your comments about the, getting those guys while they're thatched and in the spring, that kind of thing. So I guess looking at all the different species and seeing what their needs are and then having to um, sort of adapt your, pra your practice to species specific um, uh, things because uh, fighting against uh, stuff like bellflowers continually or, you know, and put having to put up sort of physical blocks so that they don't uh, come over. That's, uh, that's a lot of what I'm dealing with. Um, trying to have stuff like thyme or having uh, creeping jennies or oat grass as a uh, ground coverage instead of, um, you know, the, the native invasive species. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I really enjoyed what you said about, uh, 
uh, sort of picking out a seasonal spot where it's like, oh, okay, this is sort of where they're not growing as fast. So we can get in there and do something about it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and the bellflowers in Winnipeg, you know, that would just, just just as interesting as as the reeds here. They're really problematic, and you and I both like working together. Had a, I mean, it's it does feel impossible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it does feel impossible, and I think that's why so many people turn to chemicals and um, you know trial and error, as as Marco and Carrie and I, and I'm sure many others know, is helpful, but. I think at a certain, I, for me sometimes, it's just the the industry only offers you so many options. And so I guess ultimately that's why I've always wanted to do a sod alternative or just make a lot of these plants approachable and interesting to people, you know, that maybe wouldn't be as keen to be a part of this particular conversation, but still care a lot about, about what, you know about contributing in a in a good way um but i carry can attest to this it's it's hard to convince a client to go the better way or more sustainable way when it takes longer is harder is you know more challenging um so i, I just sort of want to bridge that gap somehow and as much as i do want to uh, individuals you know that maybe hire a designer in their own yard to make better choices. What I discovered, I just, it's sort of like with anything else in the food industry, it's, or, or recycling, you can recycle things and you put it in the bin, but then the city just sells it and ships it to the Philippines. Like at a certain point, there's only so much residents can do in their own yard if we're literally uh, building like super highways for these, these invasive plants to grow. Um, so I really think that bringing practices for, like Marco or even just your, your average gardener in a city, I think that we've overlooked some of those things and that maybe we can humble ourselves and scale up on some of these simple solutions. So. I think education is key too, like this, like you guys are doing, because, you know, if you know, having people identify these things early, you know, if you got a small patch of this reed, maybe, you know, if you can identify it quick, you know, maybe people can start, you know, at, tackling it that way and just dig it up early you yeah. know, before it can get a good foothold. I think ID is probably key, education. And like you said, first thing I said, oh, those are cool. Well, maybe it's part of it is educating that, hey, guys, these may look good, but this is an, you know, an invasive species. And then here are the reasons why we don't want it here in our local area. That's right. You know, yeah, exactly. Um, and does anyone else have anything you'd like to add or any more questions? I, I could ask a few more, but I'd like to open the floor to other people. So I did have a few questions. Let's let me go back through my notes here, Marco. Um, I really liked how you pointed out closing your own loops, and um, again, you know the the maintenance or so-called maintenance I observe around the city is really it's really lateral and, and, and I don't see any loops closing there. And in fact, I, uh, I've noticed a lot of sort of uh, harmful intervention, even though it's being played up as, 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 uh, as, as some form of care. So I really appreciate pointing that out of not just closing. I think we think about, we talk about um, life cycles and regenerative living quite figuratively where like how can we live in a closed loop society but we often don't know how to like you said close our own loops um and so i I, you know i also see your work as a really you know a way to start thinking differently about the way we're living just in our own spaces and closing your own loops is is a really interesting way to put that um i asked you earlier about like um, I think what I've been missing, so I asked you earlier, but I have been trying to use some of that thatch material to grow 
microorganisms on. And so earlier you mentioned uh, millipedes, isopods. I think what I've been missing is the shredders. And so those guys, um, they're just breaking down the larger matter into, like, can I say blend up my, shred up my stuff and, and not need the shredders? Are they offering other sort of relationships that wouldn't be there if I just grind up my own material like that? Like, should I be, I think you order isopods sometimes, I thought I noticed, or, um, and, and Carrie and I used to in the past, like order ladybugs for pest control and, yeah. and, and whatnot. Um, is that maybe what I'm missing or, or it's because, I guess what's the process, how about that from going IMO two to three? I, you didn't spend okay. too much time on no. going from two to three to four. Um, and for me, that's sort of where I've been getting stuck. Um, for anyone that wants to try the, the collection process that Marco described, it's really easy and fun and, and satisfying. It, it, it really, you really do get that white fuzz and, and it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and also Marco, the rice itself, like um, the mold contamination, like sometimes, you know, I'll get a bright pink or a bright orange, you know, um, mold. And I'm unsure if it's like an indigenous organism or if maybe I my it's it's from the rice or possibly you know I've should I worry about sort of getting lots of different colors in some of those collections or um, yeah I don't worry about that too much um, you know because what happens is the you know the, the different colors are different colonies of it could be bacteria it could be a mold it could be this could be that you know something came it's some, usually something that came out of that soil so part of the process is you know trust in the process and understanding that you know one of the principles of natural farming is good and bad are the same when things are in balance so you know mm -hmm. everything even even soil have, will have anthrax or have every soil will have something in it that if there was enough of it it would be a bad thing um, so we're focusing on just catch, capturing that balance. Um, a lot of times, though, if you go too long, you leave it out too long, now you start growing other cultures. Um, so okay. it's, it's important to kind of catch it at that peak time before okay. all those colors kind of take over it. And then that wouldn't be a preferred collection. You know, you kind of, I'd say, we'll go back, try another one, a little less right. colors, and look, the timing was better. Right. So as you if you wouldn't mind as you move from explaining like how to go two to three can you just remind me so after i i almost one week what is that little window of time i've got the fuzzy am i doing the sugar right away yeah yeah okay. you want to do it right away because even even like say if you went if you drove somewhere far for your collection you may yeah. want to bring your sugar with you and do it like before you even get in the car because what happens is you want to lock that snapshot in and if you're driving two more hours with this rice now it could start deteriorating and you're right. losing that mi microbiology you capture yeah, and in fact my background in you know rice is one of the things that that like you get, you don't let a pot of rice just cool off. Right. The center gets, you know, it's one of the most, um, uh, it can cause the most, one of, it's one of the most like poisoning causing yes. uh, foods that you can have. So that I didn't know. And I think that I was definitely leaving it too long. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I really appreciate that. And then if you don't mind to just describe going from two, three to two to three to four and then Maybe yeah. we can wrap it up soon. Okay, yeah. So we, you know, we talked to IMO, IMO. So we put our box of rice out, we collected that fuzz. That's IMO one. We combine that weight of that box of rice to sugar. That's IMO two. Shelf stable. You can put that on your shelf. Good to go. Now you want to go from a different you know, you want to go even more. You want to multiply those microbes even more. Remember what I said, like the IMO one or two is X. Well, if you go IMO three, you know, you're going thousands of X. It's really you're multiplying it. So the way you do that is you want to take, usually it can be two to three ingredients. I've done, you know, three ingredients, but on a basic level, rice, bran, and wood chips, very basic level equal uh, volume each 
mix them together, whether, you know, kind of equally distributed, combined neatly, e evenly, sorry. And then, so now you have this pile of just dry rice bran, dry wood chips, right? So now how do we get this thing inoculated? Well, that's where hopefully you've been collecting a lot of those IMO2s. You have several of those jars, right? <laughs> so what we want to do is, and we also talked about a few of the inputs, the OHN, the FPJs. You got to have those as well when you start to make an IMO3. So in short, two ingredients, rice bran, wood chips combined together when they're dry. In a bucket, now you want to add your IMO2s. I use several. I may use a dozen teaspoons of IMO2 in a five-gallon bucket. Add that OHN, add some FPJs, stir that up, a little bit of seawater in there. Seawater is a very valuable input for natural farming, by the way. Um, diluted seawater. So now I, in that bucket, I've mixed all these different IMO2s from the FPJs, the OHN, and now I take that and wet that pile of rice bran and wood chips. Wet it turn it, wet it, get it a consistency to where when you're squeezing it, you don't want any drops dripping. You just want a little bit of wet in between your knuckles when you squeeze a piece of it. And now that's now IMO3, you're mixed up. What will happen is very quickly, this pile will start heating up. The key to IMO is you can't let it get above 120 degrees, you know, 125 at the very most. But when, it, when you start getting over that, temperature, you start degrading your fungi, start degrading your yeast, start degrading a lot of things that are in those collections. See, and this is where a lot of people get confused with a thermophilic compost, because, you know, in a compost, you want that temperature. You're like, yes, 165. I got a high, you know, my compost is cruising. That's good. That's one thing. This is an IMO. This is where we're wanting to cultivate and culture those floor, those microbes off the floor of the soil. We want to cultivate that now. So if I get that temperature over 120, 125 degrees, I'm going to be losing that. So now that's not going to be preferred. So turn in this pile, moisture, like I said, within 24 hours, it's going to start heating up. Check the temperature. Oh, man, that first day, already 90 degrees. Several few hours after that, it may be ready, already creeping up to 120. Now you want to turn it, turn it. When you turn it, it's going to cool it down. When you turn it, it's going to break up. What's going to also happen is that first day, you're going to see a lot of fungi, a lot of blooms. And I'll just share my screen again because um, this is an IMO pile right here. This is, this is when it's finished. You'll get fuzzy blooms on it. And while it's still in the process of heating up, each day you want to turn it and then break up the pieces of um, the big clumps of mycelium, the big clumps of fungi, because you want to redistribute this. You know, and then over a process of about a week, temperature goes up, turning it, shorten, lowering the height of the pile for a cooler pile, coning up the pile for more heat, depending on where you're at in the winter or summer. You got to go to work. You can't be there for eight hours. You want to flatten your pile so the temperature doesn't get out of control. It's very important. So over the course of about a week to 10 days, this IMO pile turning, flipping, breaking up is slowly um, inoculates and then microbiology that we caught is just going to bloom in here and this picture you see on the screen is just kind of an example of what IMO3 can look like and now this is a now I can take the handful of this sprinkle it out on my beds you can put it out on your garden and now this is how you kind of inoculate your beds between crops and what all this microbiology does is it's it's, it's speeding up that that nutrient cycle we talked about, you know, think about it. If I just take a handful of garden soil, that's one thing. And that's, that can, that's wonderful. But now if I took a handful of that IMO, the amount of biology that's in this now is, is just so much more, so much more that now that the microbes will just break this um, organic material down faster and in turn feed your plants faster. And then that's when now having those sugary, ferments that we talked about really come into play because now all this soil biology can just take those ferments and just it just tears them up it just eats them all you know consumes them whereas if you put too sugar too much sugar into just regular soil without a lot of biology it's going to throw off the balance of your soil 
the biology won't be able to consume that energy fast enough. Um, and that's kind of the importance of an IMO3 pile. And then if you take that another step forward, so you went 10 days on the IMO3, now you have this pile of rice bran and wood chips, which is very fuzzy, loaded with microbiology. Um, but now we want to introduce some of the garden soil into this picture, right? So now the IMO3 is all just kind of what we collected from the forest. And now we're back on our property. I want to mix IMO3 by weight with my garden soil, like my soil pile that's outside. Mm -hmm. Mix them together by weight. And now I'm bringing in all these protozoa, nematodes, you know, those parts of the soil food web are now coming into this. And now I got fungi, bacteria, and I got the whole gamut of soil food web right in my hands, you know, and that's the beauty of it because all we're doing is buying time. We're doing these things in the off season or in the, at the end of summer in the winter. So then when spring comes, I'm ready. My soil is ready to take all this inoculation and, and get some party started. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell with IMO 3, 4. And then IMO 5 would be taking that IMO 4, adding a high nitrogen source to bring a little bit of fertilizer back into it. Um, that's right. So and a high nitrogen source could be like manure. If you don't do manures, you can do things like comfrey, dead nettles, things like that that are partially kind of decomposed. Okay. Um, shoot, I was going to ask one more question. That. So I don't know if anyone um, has any, any last comments or questions, I invite that. But otherwise, um, I can wrap it up soon. I know uh, Marco might need to get back to work. Um, uh, I, I saw that uh, uh, we're recording. I was wondering if it's possible. Uh, there's a few areas of your discussion that I'm super interested in, but would uh, need to do a little bit of research to understand a little uh, uh, a little bit more about it. Um, is the recording available, Lindsay? Yeah. Um, right, Anna? It'll be available on YouTube. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, and I'll be able to share a link. And also, I was thinking of... Uh, Maybe going through the recording and um, typing out a little like step by step, and I would maybe run it by you first, uh, Marco. But something that I could, I know I'm going to have a few people um, wa watching the recording. So if it's all right with you, Marco, I might, you know, type out a little IMO one to five step by step thing. Maybe throw your logo on it, and that's something I could share with you, Carrie, alongside the uh, the link. Um, that would be lovely because there's. Yeah. Uh, there's some things I'm quite curious about, but I just don't have the knowledge to be able to interact and ask the questions. And I bet you I will have some later. Yeah. So okay. that would be super helpful. For sure. And I think that's what you guys were talking about for education in general, right? Exactly. It's good to start there. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Definitely. And also you can follow my Instagram. I go over a lot of these processes and have some videos and things. Perfect. Um, I typed it in my name there. Oh, you did? Yeah. Marco underscore is underscore growing. Awesome. Okay. That's something I'll uh, definitely yeah. do as well. Amazing. Yeah. Well, um, thank you everyone who, who came today. I know it's not easy, like I said, on a Monday. And thank you, Marco, for your time. And, um, yeah, if that's, if that's it, that's all. Then um, we'll wrap it up here. I don't know if Anna, there are any closing remarks or if we'll just uh, sign out. Yeah, well, my closing remarks really are just to thank you, Lindsay and Marco, for your time, for sharing um, this knowledge with us. Um, I agree with Carrie that it's um, it's good to have it recorded so we can kind of play back and learn step by step from everything you shared with us today. Yay, knowledge. All right, awesome. Thanks, Lindsay, for making this happen. We appreciate thank those you. who were able to also join us uh, by, uh, by Zoom. Uh, thanks for taking the time. All right, folks, we're going to close it up and see you next time. We invite you back to check out the, the ongoing schedule of events for this week that the Masters of Design students have put together. Go to concordia.ca slash four, and you'll see the full events calendar there of daily activities. Perfect. On that note, bye, Thanks, everybody. Winnipeg, for showing up. I appreciate <laughs> Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.